The morning sun was streaming in the canvas tent when he awakened. His many days on the trail had made him stiff and sore. And so he slowly exited the tent, looking about and listening carefully for anything out of the ordinary. Then he moved his hands slowly over the remains of last night's fire, checking to see if any heat remained. Any hot coals would surely alert someone to his recent presence, and they could pinpoint it to within a couple of hours. Putting on his flat-crowned hat, he got up and then moved his rifle, hunting pouch, and powder horn out from under the canvas where they had been protected from the heavy morning dew. Today would be a good day to rest and do some hunting, as he desperately needed to stretch out his meager rations as much as possible. With that in mind, and feeling quite positive about the beautiful day that the Almighty had blessed him with, he carefully buckled on the heavy leather belt about his hunting frock, and then checked to make sure that all of his pouches were in their proper order. After this, he slung the hunting pouch and the powder horn over his shoulder, checking to make sure that the stopper was firmly in place. He was running low on powder, and it had to last him until he got to Fort Logan. He retrieved his tomahawk and slid it into his familiar spot on his back. As the area seemed to be relatively safe, he was going to leave the bulk of his supplies at the tent including the knapsack of the deceased Ephraim Kane. Next, he leaned his rifle over against a tree, close to hand, and then busied himself, closing the flaps of the tent, unrolling them and fastening them together with the simple blanket pins. That job accomplished, he went over and retrieved his rifle and put it on full cock, wiping the frizzen with his finger to clear it of any grease or dust that might interfere with the spark, and then he carefully tapped the charge in the pan to make sure that the powder was dry and in its proper location next to the vent hole. As he stepped out into the forest, his heart was lifted by the summer sounds of the cicadas around him. Surely on such a fine day, Providence would smile upon him and give him a rabbit or a large squirrel for his supper. He made his way down to a small creek where he could look for animal sign. And then he saw it. There in the sandy soil of the creek was the distinct print of a moccasined foot by the look of it only a few hours old. Now, his senses on high alert, his heart pounding and his mouth suddenly dry, he slowly stepped forward, muzzle at the ready. He walked out onto the main trail, wary of every moving leaf, in every dark stump, expecting an attack from any quarter at any time. Approaching a large maple tree that grew beside a small gully, he swept it with his eyes as well as his muzzle, then accidentally broke a stick when he stepped on it. He silently berated himself for being so careless. He then paused for a moment by the protection of the large trunk and then squatted down, removing his hat to fan himself. His hair was still growing in from where it had been shaved because of a lice infestation. He paused for a few minutes more, 
letting the forest settle down around him. And then placing his hat back on his head. And once more checking his surroundings. He lifted the rifle back up to his shoulder and stepped out once more onto the trail. He debated with himself about going back to the tent and just fleeing the area, but the lure of fresh meat drove him onward. After all, perhaps everything would be well. When he got to a place where the trail was brightly lit, he stepped slowly and carefully. He was out hunting for his supper, and he wanted nothing to do with getting into a fight. He was certainly not looking for trouble. All of his senses were on high alert, and the sounds of the forest seemed normal, so he continued his hunt. Indians fired first, and though he was taken by surprise, he quickly fired back. Remarkably, they all missed, and so clutching his now empty rifle, he turned and ran the other direction, with the natives hot on his heels. <laughs> Meanwhile, Another two braves from the same hunting party were following his trail as well. As they knelt down and were debating the direction of these tracks, trying to decide what to do about the obvious white man in their area, three shots rang out in the distance. They quickly hid themselves on opposite sides of the trail and waited. And before long, he ran right into their arms. They tied his hands behind him and then rolling him over, they took his tomahawk and his knife. Nita Shemaniki, cut the holster! Piallo, we be piallo. Piallo, piallo. As he staggered groggily along, his legs continued to buckle under him from time to time as his captors roughly pushed him on. Giallo! Soon they reached the hunting camp, where the leader gestured with his club and indicated that they should tie him to a tree. It was obvious from the bare dirt around the tree that he wasn't the first captive tied there. Run, you die! Ah. 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 Take it, take it. <laughs> After a while, the leader of the group rose to his feet and they began debating. Ah. He listened with a growing terror in his heart. 
as they debated what was to become of them. There was a grimness to the face of the one Shawnee with the red cap. The leader stirred the fire as the debate continued. The one word he did understand was Tanaka, which meant buffalo. And he felt that they were discussing how the white man had been hunting and killing them, so that in places game had become scarce. He heard the word white man, and then they all listened and waited, as the eldest of the hunting party stoically waited for his turn at the discussion, leaning all the while upon his rifle. The leader of the tribe picked up a piece of dung, and while he didn't understand the language, the context was clear. They thought little indeed of the white man. Then the elder spake. He made a gesture, pushing away with his hand, and he knew that they wanted to drive all white men from the hunting land of Kentucky. Back on the trail, Wayne Murphy, the grizzled and seasoned long hunter, was himself out hunting for a meal. He heard the shots ring out and immediately went on the alert. His pace slowed and he began looking for any signs that might indicate who was firing. Before long, he came upon something familiar, the print of a buckled shoe in the soft dirt. He measured it carefully with his hand, all the while thinking to himself, that feller is gonna have to get himself some moccasins if he's ever gonna get out of this alive. Now on a mission to rescue his friend, if he could, he followed the trail to the Indian hunting party's encampment and stealthily he crept out from under the cover of the forest, edging ever closer to where he could see what was going on. As he crouched there, he could see that they were already beginning to torment their captive. The one was holding a knife through his throat, while the leader of the party threatened him with the war club. <laughs> yeah. One of the Indians indicated that they should put him to death, and with no that move. thought, he writhed against the tree. Then without warning, the leader of the party struck a vicious blow at the back of his leg, causing him to fall and twist his arms painfully against the rope as his weight dangled against the tree. As he hung there awaiting his fate and wondering if his wife and family would ever know what became of him and watching his dreams of a beautiful future in the Ohio country fade before his very eyes, there was a cry and a shot rang out. And suddenly, as taken by surprise, the Indians all fled into the bush. From where he was tied, he couldn't twist around enough to see who it was. As he frantically looked from side to side, he heard quick footsteps, and then a reassuring hand placed upon his shoulder. There was the sound of a knife sawing through the ropes, and then as quickly as he could, he worked the rest of the ropes off of his wrists and let them fall to the ground. He picked up his patch knife, grabbed his hat, placed it on his head, and then ran over to where his belt knife, tomahawk, and rifle were leaned against a tree. Then grabbing up the rifle, they took off for the forest. The Indians had reloaded, and just as they were leaving, burst out of the brush with a counterattack. They safely made it to the cover of the woods, while the yells of the braves rang out behind them. Cries of rage and disappointment at losing not only their captive but also the valuable rifle. So with little debate, they decided to follow the white men into the trees. But they quickly outdistanced their pursuers, disappearing into the thick forest to live another day.